All right, welcome everyone to Ask the Developer Live. Really excited to be here today. Ask the Developer Live is a series of conversations with thought leaders in the mobile gaming industry, helping you to take your app and mobile gaming business to the next level. I'm your host, Michael Fortune, and I work in product marketing at AppLevin. For those of you who aren't familiar with AppLevin, we provide a technology platform that helps app and game developers to take their businesses to the next level. We help out with everything from monetization to user acquisition, analytics, and creative development. So super excited to be here today. Um, we had a great year in 2020 and you know, had over 2,500 guests uh, when we kicked the series off last year and are excited to do the same this year. So uh, yeah, please uh, visit our, our YouTube channel to uh, stay up to date on our newest content and also to look at our content from, from uh, 2020. So for this eighth installment of Ask the Developer Live, uh, we'll be talking to leaders in the uh, gaming industry to learn more about how user acquisition and specifically how the automation of marketing is really becoming a competitive advantage for marketers in these days. Uh, I'd love to start off with some introductions and after we do that, we'll move into the content and as always, we'll wrap everything up with a live Q&A and some prizes at the end. So without further ado, um, really excited to have our guests here. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Sack, who's been with AppLevin since it acquired Max in late 2018. So after several years at Mopub, Dan joined Max as the CEO to provide developers with a more effective mediation layer. As VP of Platform at AppLevin, uh, he works with our partners to help them get the most out of our business solutions in monetization and user acquisition. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Mike. I would also like to introduce uh, our guest, Nick Tallarico, who's the founder and CEO of Super Free Games. It's a mobile game studio you've definitely heard of. They operate some of the most popular games in the world, including Word Collect and Trivia Star. Uh, you can find them at the top of the charts. Really excited to have you here, Nick. Uh, and you guys were also recently acquired by Stillfront. Uh, congrats on that. And we'll, we'll jump a little bit into that later on. But uh, without further ado, we'd, we'd love to kick it over to you, uh, Dan, and thank you to both for, for joining us here. Thanks, Mike. Sounds good. Well, th thanks for getting us started, Mike. Thanks for everyone that is tuned in. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining us. Uh, so Hi, we will jump right into it. Uh, a bit of background on your company. When did you launch your company? Where are you based? How many people do you employ? Uh, all those things. Yeah, um, we started almost exactly 10 years ago. It was, I, I believe, February 4th of 2011. So we're about to have our 10 year anniversary. Um, currently we employ something around 80, 85 people. Uh, our largest office is in the Bay Area, but we actually have offices in Boise, Idaho, uh, New York, uh, Berlin, Singapore, and a few other places as well. So we're a pretty spread out remote team. Sounds good. And for the audience, are there specific verticals your studio focuses on? Yeah. Uh, when we started the company, we were focused mainly on social casinos. So we started with bingo, moved into slots, video poker, stuff like that. Uh, in 2017, we pivoted and started focusing on casual games, which is a pretty broad catch-all term. Um, so more specifically, um, word games, our largest word game is Word Collect. Trivia, our largest trivia game is Trivia Star. And then we have some puzzle games that we haven't quite cracked yet, um, but we're hard at work trying to figure them out. Sounds good. And, and of your current portfolio, uh, which specific <clears throat> games are, are you most focused on at the moment? And then also, um, which games are you currently uh, actively pushing and, and, and trying to grow? Yeah, it's, a, it's tough to answer most focused. Uh, our bread and butter are Word Collect and Trivia Star, so they're always going to get a lot of love and a lot of attention, and they do get the majority of the UA. Um, not to say that those are locked down by product, but they are more mature games. So product is actually more focused on the, the puzzle games I just mentioned that aren't really as, as advanced, and they aren't working quite as well. So depending on the department within within our company, uh, there's different focus assigned to different games. Sounds good. So you've got some some tried and true hits, and then you've got some some other projects you're 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 working on as well. Um, of the team you've just described, uh, spread globally, 
how many people do you have working on ad monetization and UA? And is it all one one unit or are they siloed? Uh, kind of siloed, kind of related. Um, ad monetization team is tiny. It, for a long time, it was just me. Um, and now <laughs> it's just just Jill on our team. Um, I, I still help out, but, but she really runs the majority of it. Uh, for UA, it's a much larger team. We only have, I think, five UA managers, people actually uh, managing spend. But it's a team of like 25, uh, lots of motion graphics artists, uh, creative analysts, UA analysts, things like that. So um, it's like 80, 80, 85 percent of our budget. So, yeah, it's a pretty big team to manage all that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's awesome. It should, I mean, you guys run some beautiful creative, so it certainly shows. Um, and how long have you been working with AppLovin? Uh, nine plus years, most of our existence. Got it. Um, so, so long, much longer than I've been at App Eleven. Um, cool. So uh, a bit that's been on team and portfolio. So let's get into uh, tools. So uh, just to kick things off, what third party tools is your company currently leveraging to drive growth in your games? Um, well, we work with a lot of different networks on UA. So um, obviously Facebook, Google, Apple Search. Um, Apple and Iron Source Unity, you know, the, 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 the kind of tried and true, well-recognized brands. Um, our attribution is Adjust. Um, we've been with them for a long time. I think we may have even been their first North American customer. Um, for uh, App Store testing, we use Store Maven, have a really good relationship with them. Um, our Facebook uh, SaaS provider, um, is probably one that, that most people haven't heard of. Uh, it's called AdChill. Um, new up and coming. Uh, I think we are actually their first customer, but we've worked really closely with them for the last year or so to, uh, to just get their tools in a place where we can really use them. And, and it's been a great relationship. So we work with a lot of different partners. Very cool. We've seen over the past several months, a handful of uh, ad networks roll out uh, new automated campaigns, campaign features, that sort of thing. Are you actively using any of these relatively new uh, UA campaign types, automated campaign types offered by any of your uh, ad network partners? Definitely. Um, and I mean, we used to have I think three open recs for UA managers, and now we've actually whittled that down to one. Um, <laughs> and that's it, we've done that since we started working with uh, Facebook AAA, uh, Unity's automated UA, and, and App Levens as well. Um, it's not that's not to say that it's really just set it and forget it. You don't have to look at it at all. We do have people monitoring, measuring, and definitely focused on the creative. Um, but it takes a lot of the heavy lifting out of UA, so we we haven't had to grow the team as much as as we thought we would. Um, I, I think to manage a budget that's closing in on 10 million a month uh, with a team of UA managers our size, it, it would be impossible to do without those tools, the, the automated UA tools. Absolutely agree, absolutely agree. Okay, cool. So uh, with, with that context, um, let's talk about um, one of your smash hits, Word Collect. I haven't checked the app store today, but I'd imagine that's at the top of the uh, word category. Um, so uh, question one is, when did you launch this game? And was it an, was it an immediate hit? Um, we launched it late November uh, of 2017, early December of 2017 for iOS. Uh, normally we go Android and then iOS. I can't say it was an immediate hit. Um, but it showed immediate signs of promise. Uh, retention was solid out the gate. Um, it took us a while to figure out ad monetization. It was our first really ad supported game. Um, it also took us a while to figure out how to buy on casual games. We had been social casino to that point. Um, frankly, it shouldn't have taken, taken us as long as it did, but it, it took a while. Um, but it's when we got the ad monetization in the UA right that things kind of went up and to the right. And, and that's, that's where they've gone ever since. And what, uh, what, do you recall what, what caused you to uh, jump into this category from social casino to, to casual and, and then word? 
Yeah, we didn't we didn't want to have to buy or hire a, a brand new team. We we wanted to see what we could build that looked compelling, where the CPIs weren't too high. Um, maybe the market wasn't quite saturated yet, um, but we wanted to do that with the team we had. Um, and I know the games aren't really similar in 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 play style, or you know, if you just look at them. But we felt pretty confident that we could build and, and compete in the word category with the, the team we had. And, and when you say it took you some time to figure out how to, it sounds like longer than, than you wish it had, but when you say it took you some time to figure out how to buy um, for a word game, what, what exactly are you referring to? Yeah, so casino, I mean, for people who have done media buying for casino games, it's whale hunting. Uh, I'm going to oversimplify it, but Generally, you want to say if you buy a thousand users, you get somewhere between 50 and 100 who monetize and one who is a whale. Um, the whales really are carrying the weight of, of uh, making your cohorts return the, the spend in, in whole. Um, and that's the philosophy and the processes and the behaviors that we took when we started buying on, on casual. And it just doesn't work. Like you can't buy a whole lot of $8 installs for, for word collect or trivia star. Um, so we, like I said, it shouldn't have taken this long, but we had to move towards a, a rate rate card mode of buying where it was, you know, this channel, this, these targets, the LTV projects to be this. So just keep your CAC, your cost of acquisition uh, lower than that. And we had a really hard time getting the CPIs down, getting the cost of acquisition down. And that's when we invested really heavily in our, in our creative team. Um, if, if you're spending a lot for a long time, the only way you can keep the CAC down is, is by investing in creative. Um, and like I said, it was just a, a mental shift and it took us a little too long to, to figure it out. But when we did, it, it, was, it was pretty great. Very cool. Okay, so let's, let's fast forward a bit to 2021. Um, so let's first talk a bit about how you're currently leveraging app Lovin's product set on both sides to drive growth in word collect specifically. Yeah. Um, by both sides, I'm assuming you mean UA and, and monetization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I did speak outside of having to figure out UA, uh, it took us a little while to figure out ad monetization. And frankly, we just, I don't think we chose the right mediation partner um, out the gate, excuse me. And um, when we switched to Max, uh, it just gave us the tool set that we needed for a small team um, to get the CPIs and the ad ARP DAOs up to a level that allowed us to buy more. So to your point, it really is uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, so ever since then, Max has been our central provider. Uh, we've integrated a lot more networks into Max for mediation, um, especially on banners. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't see Max going anywhere. It's, it's the relationship that's, that's served us well so far. Um, then on the UA side, I mean, I said for the last nine years, we've been using App Loving for UA. Um, needless to say, the tools have gotten uh, more and more sophisticated and uh, you know, I like to think that we as developers, not we as super free, but we as developers have pushed Max to grow, but, mm -hmm. it, or not Max, but App Loving. But uh, on the flip side, you know, I feel like as these tools get more sophisticated, it, it pushes us to grow and, and pulls us in the direction that we need to be. Um, I think a good example of that would be uh, the automated bidder on Trivia Star. Um, I mentioned earlier that we, we had rate cards, basically, like don't go above this CPI on this channel and these, this set of targets. Um, but the ROAS bidder um, uh, that, that App 11 came out with and we tested first on Trivia Star, uh, it was a solid 70% over the CPI caps that I had put in. And I remember saying to the App 11 team, like, there's no way these cohorts are going to get whole. Um, and they did, and they did quickly. So that that taught us um, not only could we bid more on the app level network, but also on the other channels we use. I mean, that's, that's really when super tri when trivia got supercharged. Awesome. So some context for the audience, for those that don't know, if you are on max, you have the option to uh, run a campaign uh, 
uh, UA campaign against AppLevin's ad network where you're bidding on ROAS uh, as opposed to bidding on CPI. Uh, and those ROAS campaigns are going to smartly figure out on a user level what your game should bid to back out to whatever goals you set. So that's, that's the very high level summary of the feature Nick's referring to, which was launched, I wanna say August, September and is now um, how close to all of the spend in the app Levin's network buy games on Macs, transact in our network, which is a shift from the CPI campaigns that uh, where uh, uh, an advertiser would set a CPI on a campaign level and then adjust CPIs by sources, specific apps, categories, et cetera. So um, we will talk a bit more now about, uh, about that and how you and your company are using uh, this feature, Nick. So just kind of walk everyone through it. Can you talk a bit about how you run your word collect campaigns in app Levin's ad network today? Yeah. Um, you want me to talk about the CPI campaigns first or just focus on how, the, how many? Uh, yeah, sure. A little bit of back, a, a bit of background on how you used to run them and then how many, you know, what it looks like today. How many campaigns are you running today for word collect, iOS, Android, how you manage budget globally, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so we used to run it uh, with, as you said, CPI campaigns where we may have had one campaign set up rewarded, one for non-rewarded, one for US, one for tier one. Um, and in each one of those campaigns, the UA manager and the analysts and, and the rest of the team would have to go in, um, manage CPIs on a pub level, uh, publisher level, uh, as well as on geo level, assuming that there were uh, multiple geos sp split in or set under one campaign. Um, and then all the creative under the campaign as well. Um, and sometimes some creative was working well with one publisher uh, or in one territory, but might not work in another. So it was a lot of compromising and a lot of manual labor. Um, our team is great and they, you know, they, they did it very well at a high level, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, it was, it wasn't fun. It was a slog. That was the name of the business. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, I was a little skeptical of, of the, the automated bidding, the auto row as feature, but um, mm -hmm. I just, I kind of thought that if you had a team that could do all that hard work um, and do it intelligently, it was a leg up. So I didn't think that, um, a computer could do the work for us. Uh, but, you know, I'll say by October, I was, I was fully convinced that it worked well. So, <laughs> so now, um, actually, when we started the, the ROAS campaigns, it was, um, we still split out the, the geos under multiple campaigns. Um, mm -hmm. But now that, that even that's been fixed. So uh, I don't think we have one campaign for Word Collect iOS and one for Word Collect Android, but it is pretty close. Um, and we've actually been able to add more territories to it because it takes less work to manage them. So I'm not saying we have huge businesses because it's, it's an English language game by its nature. Um, we also have Spanish, but um, I'm not saying we have huge businesses outside of English speaking territories, but we are able to pick up English speaking users in countries where English is not necessarily the predominant language. Um, and that's added a nice, nice little chunk to our business as well. Um, so I think, I mean, summarily, it's just, it's less work, it's more focus on measuring and testing new territories and still a lot of focus on the creative, um, but it's not as much of a slog as it, as it used to be. Got it. Okay, so, and, and today with Word, let's just isolate, Word Collect iOS, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, but do, do you know how many campaign, distinct campaigns you currently have running in our network? Across all games or just Word Collect iOS? Just Word Collect iOS. Probably like it's a, one, it's two, one or maybe two. three. One or maybe two. Three. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then within a specific campaign, Word Collect iOS campaign, you have that targeting a, a, a ton of geos around the world. And then you set a, a daily budget on a geo level. And then you also set a, a ROAS target on a geo level, right? Correct. Yeah. 
Um, so, and every every week we're layering in a few more geos. Got it. So I'll just uh, some context for the audience. So five months ago, or we'll call it six months ago, five six months ago, uh, tons of CPI campaigns, uh, word collect iOS, perhaps a CPI campaign for just for rewarded video, a separate one for non rewarded full screen inventory, um, then. Uh, a lot of uh, hours and, 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 and button pushing around CPI setting by source, by geo. And then on top of that difference in creative performance across all of these different dimensions, which led to your team having to manage a bunch of campaigns, which your team was and is very good at. Um, and then also some just built in compromise um, due to the fact that this creative might work well over here, but not over here. Something's got to give um, six months ago. And now today, all of that has been consolidated into, let's just call it two word collect iOS campaigns that are intelligently buying globally to a ROAS target you set. And we'll talk more about that in a second. And on top of that, you've been able to open up new geos. You've been able to start spending, acquire users profitably in geos that you previously weren't even touching. Correct. Yeah. So um, an example in new geos would be, um, we'll just say Switzerland. Um, fair amount of disposable income in Switzerland, a lot of English, um, but a re relatively small country. And because of all of that, manual labor that we were just talking about, it just wasn't worth turning on a territory mm -hmm. like that, or maybe Germany, maybe France. These are obviously bigger countries. Um, but since it's all managed in one campaign, since we can set the day zero ROAS target per country um, and the budget per country, um, it's, it's not a lot of work to, to layer in more. Now we didn't just open it up to the whole world right away because there are gonna be inefficiencies as the system learns. Um, and you know, we have to get used to measuring before we throw them all in. But like I said a minute ago, every, every week we throw in a few more and it, um, one of those geos individually might not be a big difference maker, but in aggregate, all of them added up, uh, it's, it's definitely helped us grow the business. Perfect. Um... Quick context, and then, we'll, and then we'll move into the next question. With these ROAS campaigns for the audience, uh, Word Collect iOS is set day zero, add ROAS targets by geo. So then it's the job of our uh, bidder, our UA bidder, to go out and acquire users on Nick's behalf to that day zero, add ROAS target. And then, of course, uh, Nick and his team are looking after how this spend matures. So these ROAS targets need to be set smartly such that the spend is profitable. Um, which brings us to our next question, uh, Nick. How do you determine your initial ROAS targets? It was pretty easy with WordCollect because we had a couple of years of history. Um, mm -hmm. Not as easy with Trivia Star because it was a pretty new game, maybe a month or two old, a couple months. Um, and look, it takes some guesswork and some estimation, but if you can get 14 or so days of reasonably sized cohorts, you start to get a sense of, of what the ROAS curve looks like. Um, and at a certain point, if you have enough faith, you can just draw a line out and say that we expect our revenue per install to be X dollars by day 120 or day 150. Um, and you can set that, that day target longer into the future or shorter into the future based on your cash flow requirements. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's that process that we've always been working on well before the, the ROAS bidder came out um, that allow us to, to set the targets. Um, but to your point, the team is constantly measuring. And um, in a lot of cases, even though the bidder is buying toward ad ROAS, um, it's actually improved our IAP ROAS. Uh, so the team is always tuning up or down the day zero targets based on our need for scale uh, and, and the way the cohorts are maturing and, and when they hit 100% or 125%.
So the system is going out and at times bidding aggressively for a user that it believes will be, uh, let's call it a high value ad return user. Uh, and to acquire those users in a competitive market, you need a, a competitive aggressive bid. Um, you go out and you've been successful in acquiring those users. And it just so happens that some of the time those high quality ad users who required a high bid to acquire uh, are holistically high value and also high value from an IAP revenue perspective. Yeah, and that was, that was the biggest surprise to me, frankly. Um, on Trivia Star again, uh, we went from about 7% in that purchase revenue to 20% in that purchase revenue, where the only change was we started bidding uh, with the ROAS bidder. So uh, the app loving system that is, uh, you know, it's set up to go find high quality ad ROAS players or ad ARPT out players actually fleshed out a lot of really high IAP players for us. It's awesome to hear. Cool. Um, when you think about uh, these LTV curves and ROAS curves and how you set your targets, is your team setting for Word Collect iOS specifically, do you have different day zero ROAS targets for different geos or is it one goal globally? Yeah, definitely. Um, so some of the geos where English might not be the dominant language, um, they don't mature as well. So we have to set the day zero goal in, and I'll just use Switzerland as an example again, higher than we do in the US. So maybe in the US it's 15% for round numbers, but in Switzerland we say it's gotta be 20% day zero because we know the retention is gonna be lower and the maturation is gonna be slower. Um, and that just, like I said, there's some inefficiency there. You know, it takes a little while to learn. You gotta spend some money to learn, but the, the flexibility of the system definitely helps. Cool, cool. So. Um... Sort of summary impact of the shift to these uh, these campaigns where you're able to bid on ROAS. Uh, it, for Word Collect iOS, how, how much have you been able to increase um, just raw spend? And, and has there been an impact on profitability of that spend as well? Yeah. Um, over the holidays, we significantly increased raw spend. Uh, not double, mm -hmm. but about about 40, 40% more. Um, mm. We brought that back a little bit and it all does come down to how profitable we want to be. Um, sometimes we're just buying at a little over break even uh, because we want to keep revenue growing really quickly. Um, but sometimes depending on the business needs, we want to pull back a little bit. Um, so it's not, it's not a static environment, right? Like, it's right. not that we were able to spend more and that brought more profit, but we're, we're able to tune between those two things based on our needs. Um, but yeah, I think, the, I think the biggest takeaway, and there were many, was that we were actually underbidding. Our CPIs were too low and that we're able to get uh, high quality users if we were willing to bid just a little bit more. Um, and when I say high quality, I mean more profitable. So got it. Perfect. So with the turn of a dial now, maybe this month or this week, let's, let's, uh, let's reduce our goal in the U S as an example, push more spend, drive more installs. And then next week or next month, let's dial it back and focus more on profitability. Exactly. Um, so in December and January, well, January is almost over. It was all about growth and we brought the day zero targets way down. February, we're going to kick it back towards increasing profit. Um, and we're starting already to bring the day zeros back up, as I'm sure you've seen with emails going back hmm. and forth. Um, yep. yep. It's just, uh, it's a tunable system. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, last question on uh, this specifically, impact on your team. So you mentioned job openings down from three to one. How, how broadly how has this affected your team? Where have they shifted time that they were previously spending slogging through tons of CPI campaigns, et cetera? Yeah. Um, more time on networks that aren't automated, um, but still allow us to, to get to scale. Uh, definitely more time and focus on creatives um, because you can go see in a ROAS campaign, it won't be one portrait and one uh, landscape creative that's dominating the spend. I mean, the, the spend is actually spread relatively evenly across like eight or 10 creatives. 
So that means we have to test and switch in a lot more creatives. Um, and we have a whole team focused on that, but I think one of the reasons that our UA buyers are so good is because they really, really think about the creatives. They're not just taking what others are giving them and testing them out. They're analyzing what's working um, formerly at the pub level, but now uh, just a, across the, the breadth of the campaign um, and not having to, to spend so much time managing the targets and the actual media buy. Uh, allows them to think more strategically about about our creatives. This might be off, but any impact on the number of games you you plan to produce this year? Very indirectly, yes. Directly, no, because they're two separate teams, right? Um, mm -hmm. Our UA team isn't going to go start developing products and vice versa. Um, but because we can use this tool to get a pretty good sense pretty quickly of whether or not a game is viable, um, our product team is more comfortable releasing a lot of games more quickly. Uh, we released either 11 or 12 games last year, so pretty much one a month. Um, this year we'll be a little behind that, but we'll still do nine or 10. Um, and I don't think we'd be talking about that velocity of release if we didn't have the right set of tools to, to validate the games. Makes sense. Okay, cool. All right. Um, we'll touch on the year ahead for your business and then we'll open this up. Um, so you announced some uh, big news um, last month. Uh, yeah. So talk about that for us. Uh, well, we, we are in the process of being acquired by Stillfront. Um, it is publicly available, so I'm not sharing anything that I shouldn't. Um, like I said, we've been doing this for close to 10 years now. Um, we've had some really high periods and some really low periods. I mean, we almost lost the business a couple of times. Uh, and with our growth last year, um, a lot of people uh, inquired about potentially acquiring us. And at first we weren't that interested. Um, my business partner, Brett and I uh, own the majority of the business. We don't have an external board. We didn't take venture funding. So we don't have any pressure to do anything. Um, but when we talked to Stillfront, they most importantly seemed like really good people who we would work with. Um, but also very importantly, they have a reputation of being very hands-off with their acquisitions. So they recognize that whatever makes us, us, they don't want to mess with that. Um, and vice versa, like things that work for us might not work for one of the other studios uh, under their umbrella. Um, and they're not going to force that either. So we were really attracted, um, one, at the opportunity of working with them. They're smart, experienced people. Uh, but two, uh, at the opportunity to get acquired and de-risk financially in that way, but still be able to be ourselves. And uh, we didn't have to lay off a single person. And it, it's, uh, it's been pretty great so far. Uh, deal's not closed yet, but um, it definitely feels good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. I mean, ma massive achievement knock on wood okay. that it closes. Um, you know, you just said they're going to let you continue to be you or do what you guys do, um, leave you to be you, if you will. Um, my next question is in this uh, insanely competitive market, you're, you didn't raise funding, you don't have a board, et cetera. Uh, you're up against some uh, other companies going after the same users, the same genres, who have tons and tons of cash, huge teams. Um, what to what do you attribute your success? Yeah, um, not to give you a non-answer, but it's never one thing, right? Uh, I think the main thing, and this is where I would put our team up against pretty much anybody. Um, they recognize the environment we're in. Um, I think that the, the leadership within our team is really clear on what the goals are. Uh, so people don't feel like they're operating in some vague vacuum. Um, and they just move quickly. They, our team makes decisions on their own. They make smart decisions. They know if they make a bad decision, it's not the end of the world. Um, and I think even though we don't have the budget or the resources that a lot of our competitors do, um, we out execute 
just based on the, the processes or the lack of processes, frankly, that, that we have set up. Um, so it really is just a testament to the, the intelligence and the dedication uh, of our team. You've mentioned today that there, I think you've named three companies where you were their first North American client, uh, at least two. On our side, you were the first North American publisher to get super scaled up on ROAS campaigns. So you guys are fast, you are aggressive, thoughtful, but um, you take swings, calculated swings. That, that's been my experience working with your company. Um, it's obviously working. Uh, last question, then we'll open this up. What's, what's next for your business? Thankfully, more of the same. Um, and that goes back to why we were attracted to Stillfront as an acquirer. Um, you know, we have, we have new bosses and some new requirements, but um, they want us to keep doing what we've been doing. And so we're going to do that. Uh, and that's continue to operate Word Collect and Word Nut, um, continue to operate Trivia Star, and also figure out these puzzle games. Um, I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, as with everything, it's not quite as obvious as it may seem on the outside. Uh, but as I said a minute ago, I'll put our team up against almost anybody. Awesome. Very cool. Mr. Fortune, over to you. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, we got some great questions. Uh, let's, let's jump into them. Cool. Uh, so we got one that came from uh, Sai. He's wondering, uh, Nick, if you could talk anything about your monetization structure, you know, using a blend of IEPs, ad monetization, anything you could share about how you... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I have a 10 pound terror. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah I'll, I'll speak at a pretty high level. Hang on one second. Yeah, no Rufus, <laughs> come on, buddy. He, he feels like he's protecting me. I think all I think all three people on this on this call right now have dogs like behaving for a period of time, <laughs> un, 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 undetermined yet period of time. I, I apologize, but uh, yeah, he's 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 fierce. Um, so yeah, at a high level, uh, our casino games are about ninety percent IAP, ten percent ads. Ads is an important part of the business, not that important. Um, on casual, it's 55 to 60% ads, so massively, massively important. Um, we do the basic stuff, uh, early indicators of whether or not someone is going to be an IAP monetizer. If they're not, we might be a little bit more aggressive with ads um, just to monetize them somehow. Um, recent discoveries are that a rewarded video monetizer is not necessarily not an IAP monetizer very often giving people a taste of the currency in a free way through re rewarded video will turn them into IAP monetizers later on. Um, and within the ad stack, uh, we run banners, interstitials and rewarded um, and all the usual players, everyone you would expect um, are our ad suppliers uh, within those three ad types. Um, Dan, a question for you. Um, so, Ken Bros campaigns, I think uh, talking about our app discovery campaigns, do those work for games that are monetized 100% with ads? Um, and how you know, can we help developers figure out uh, their, their ROAS targets in these app discovery campaigns? Yeah, so three things. First, the, the way the campaigns Nick's referring to their, yeah, the, the goal you set is uh, an a day zero ad row as goal. And, and we'll be rolling out more campaign types, but that's specifically what we're talking about here. So take your game by users all day long in the US, so long as you hit a day zero ad row as target of 10%. That's the idea. That's the way the system works. It's not taking into consideration IAP revenue. So that's how it works. Um, can it work for a game that's 100% ad monetized? Uh, Maybe the question is, will it scale a game like that? So the system will bid on your behalf based on how well your game monetizes. Or think of the ROAS campaigns as uh, friction to your game's growth is, is reduced, maybe even eliminated. If your game has growth potential and it monetizes well enough such that you can produce bids, that back out for you. Um, so if it monetizes well enough such that you can 
you, you're, you're able to produce high bids to go out and win inventory, um, then our system will, will suss that out and, and, and you will spend. Um, the third question was about target setting. So uh, we, we, we're, we, we can certainly give some guidance around um, what we see in certain genres. Um, every game is different. Uh, so testing's good and expected, but we can give some rough benchmarks based on uh, category, that sort of thing. Um, coming back to you, Nick, um, there was a question about how, how do you decide what percentage of your UA budget to spend on uh, tier three and tier four countries as you're expanding globally um, with these app discovery or ROAS campaigns? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It's something we're still trying to figure out um, because we've only been doing it for less than six months where we're really thinking more and more about uh, tier three, tier four, even tier two uh, campaigns. Um, I couldn't even tell you the percentage we're spending currently. It's probably somewhere around 15%, so not a huge portion. Um, but we talk a lot internally about how much future profit did you buy? Uh, and that's, that's kind of what we use as a guide on where to invest. And that might be which channel to invest in, um, it might be which game to invest in, or it might be which, uh, which territory to invest in. Makes sense. Um, seems there are some questions around IS-14, so I know we're moving into the prediction um, realm. But uh, I'll open this to either of you. How do you think iOS 14 will change your user acquisition strategy? And I think this first part will go to you, Nick, then we can kind of retweet this a bit for, for the, um, the business side of this for a few, Dan. Yeah. Um, I am concerned <laughs> deeply about iOS 14. I mean, I think every company in our space says they're data driven, um, but when you are relying on data to, to make decisions, um, if one of the major platforms pulls a chunk of that away, it, it's scary. Um, that being said, I think all of us are in the business of drawing conclusions with incomplete information. We do a lot of algebra, everybody on this call. Um, and our team, I feel, is, is pretty well set up for that kind of environment. Uh, additionally, we've already started running LAT waterfalls um, within Max. So uh, we have one uh, waterfall bidder hybrid when, where users are tracked, and then we have a separate one where users are not. Um, so we're, we're trying to get prepared very quickly for the, uh, the post-IDFA, I guess, if you want to call it the post-IDFA world. Um, so yeah, it's, it will affect things. We're running all sorts of experiments right now. Um, but uh, I would just encourage everybody to figure out what your curves look like, make some assumptions on what they might look like uh, if you do acquire an LAT user and, um, and just keep going from there. Yeah, and I think for you, Dan, is there anything you can share about how, uh, yeah, App11 is preparing you know, on the, either the monetization or the user acquisition side for, for iOS 14? I'll try to be concise. So. We were all scrambling to be ready for this four or five months ago. Um, so we did a lot to be ready for this before it was pushed back. On the Mac side, certain features to, in summary, help publishers maximize or uh, optimize monetization of LA2 users specifically. Um, so we kickstarted that five months ago still working on that so uh, your users that are LAT users we want to make sure that we're helping you maximize monetization of those users Nick touched on LAT waterfalls uh, as one feature so so that's one part of it making sure that these users that you do have that where you don't have IDFA are, are well monetized tool set around that on the buying side uh, we, uh, again, we, we started in, in, we once, but we've been here once before, you know, awaiting this change. <laughs> so 
we were we were we were pushing hard to be ready for it then on the ua side our network for a long time has allowed advertisers to acquire both idfa device id and no id lat users um so the network as it stands today these campaign types nick is describing these realized campaign types um, today advertisers that are spending in our network are buying both idfa and lat traffic when you set up a ROAS campaign today uh, it will take into account your day zero ad ROAS target and then it will go out and it will spend on your behalf both on idfa and lat traffic to your goal um, so on the on the uh, on the UA side, uh, we are we've built tools and a network that allows our partners to uh, sensibly and profitably acquire uh, users when an IDFA is present and when an IDFA is not present. Um, so that's that's the you know that's sort of the the tool set we've built to help our partners navigate uncertain uncertainty ahead beyond that i think i think the the truth is we all just need to stay um nimble and and thoughtful and resilient and figure it out as we go yeah i think that sounds good um back to you nick uh this question looks like it's about aso um do you have any best practices for localizing store pages um you know i know in the word genre you know, since it's in English, there are probably some things that you're, you're doing there. Uh, but yeah, I think at a high level, just anything you can share about ASO would, would speak to, to the question here. Yeah. Um, our team is good at ASO. Uh, we, we do get a lot of organic installs. I think that's a function of uh, how much we're spending, but it also um, some really, really well uh, optimized store pages. Um, Share a little nugget. Uh, very often, organic install success in neighboring countries, um, in one country, will inform success in neighboring countries. So, for example, if uh, if you have a lot of success in the U.S., uh, don't neglect Mexico or Canada uh, in your app store optimization. Um, in Canada, that wouldn't involve a whole lot of changes, but in Mexico, obviously, you want to not just translate. Um, but also localize and run a lot of tests um, for your Mexican store pages. Um, yeah, for the puzzle games uh, and the slots games, our slots games, I think, were translated into 32 different languages. Oh. Um, and, and that made for a lot of work on the, uh, the App Store optimization side and just getting all of those pages translated. Um, and in many cases, actually, uh, not just translated, but localized, different screenshots, um, said different things based on the the uh, the culture we were targeting. Uh, I think we got time for one last question. Uh, looks like this one is for you, Nick. Um, what kind of payback window do you aim for, and are there tools that you're using that help you to determine that? Yeah, uh, the only tool we use is Excel. I'm <laughs> embarrassed to admit that. Um, <laughs> it. It does require a little bit of a hand waviness, but it works. Uh, for slots games, we buy on a 24 month window for Word, six months, and for trivia, uh, two months. Um, and I think we'll probably kick trivia to three months pretty soon. Um, but that's, that's generally how we think about it. Um, but to that point, for years, we've always said we need to be at 100% by X number of months. We're actually switching that now where it is when we'll be at, we'd be at 125%. We're trying to build in that, that profit that we need to, to cover operations and to cover, you know, the cost of all these new games that we're developing. Yeah. And, and for you, for you, Dan, have you, have you seen app discovery give um, advertisers that you've worked with more control over this, this metric of, of earn back window? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think that's one of the, the most exciting components of it. So Nick was talking earlier about turning up or down his, the dial. Uh, we want to, 
we want to be more mindful of profitability. So let's turn up our target. We want to uh, push hard, drive more installs, spend more. Let's bring down the target. You have a direct lever over that now. I, I think if we think about how this was something you could affect before this automation arrived, um, a lot of work and uh, not as quick or direct feedback uh, or impact of that work. So I don't know. I mean, if we had more time, we could talk about it, but uh, I think advertisers were probably, uh, it, it, it would take longer to implement changes to buy back windows and there would be more uncertainty around, uh, around how, 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 can you can you really tweak that target by five percent or ten percent? Well, you have to adjust a ton of bids. And anyway, uh, I, th I think develop uh, I think advertisers now have much much tighter control over this, and it just means you can be you can you you can be faster, you can be more nimble, um, you can make changes that maybe previously were were too cumbersome to make quickly. Um, so. Short answer your question is yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in, Dan, yeah. if you don't mind, and just say one thing that we found interesting is that you know maybe a 10% uh, decrease to the day zero target would unlock a lot more than 10% spend. You're, you're basically stepping into a new tier of the pyramid, and it's a lot bigger than the one you were on. So sometimes small changes un unlocked a lot of additional spend for us, and that was, that was exciting as we were trying to scale. Awesome. Uh, I think that's about all the time we had today, but uh, Nick and Dan really wanted to thank you for joining us and would also like to thank the audience. Um, we do have a poll that's gonna be popping up on your screen in the next five seconds and there it is. Uh, if you fill that out, you get a chance to win some, some AirPods. Uh, we'd love to get some feedback from you. Um, thanks again, Nick and Dan. And, and for the audience, you can find us on YouTube, subscribe to us for previous episodes or, or upcoming content. Thanks again to both. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. Thanks, Dan. See you, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Bye.